It is good to have you here this morning. You can pull this microphone back a little bit. I'm, I'm always right on top of it. So um, this is kind of a continuation sermon um, from two weeks ago because Jesus is going to continue on with a common thought. And so I've titled this Some More Woes, Some More Woes. And this is Luke eleven forty five 45 through 54. So I want to go back to the first woes that we looked at. We looked at four woes two weeks ago. And uh, I like the play on words. I really like that when that happens. When, that, you know, like when you think of woe, you think, usually think of whoa. You know, you're pulling back on the reins of the horse and, and you're saying whoa. And, but, but it really plays into when Jesus says woe to the Pharisees, he is. He's pulling back on the reins of the direction that they are going. He doesn't want them to go in that direction anymore. There's danger in going that direction. So he's pulling back on the reins and saying woe to them. So the first one was, I called it the, the first pull on the reins was the dishwasher problem because they were having plates and cups that were washed on the outside but not the inside. And, and he pointed out that he pulled back on the reins and said, wait, your life is not supposed to be like that. You're not supposed to be clean on the outside and dirty on the, or clean on the outside and dirty on the inside. No, no, you're supposed to, that's a hypocritical life if you're living your life like that. And so he, he pulls back on the reins for that. Then the second one is, the second pull is what I called seed counting. And what they were doing in this situation, they were focused on the secondary rather than the primary. And instead of being focused on loving God and, and live, showing the love and justice of God to others, they're out in their garden counting seeds. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We'll put that one over here. And that's how they spent it. And he pulled back on the reins and says, wait a minute, that, you, you shouldn't be on the secondary. You need to be on the primary. The third one was the third pole was the platform seat. And that was they wanted to be seen. They wanted to be seen by others. They dressed in such a way to be greeted by others. And it was all about an issue of pride. And he said, you need to pull back the reins there. And then the last one was, was the grave etiquette. And I, I was thinking about that. We do have a grave etiquette, or at least some of us still do. I do graveside services and things like that. And it's interesting to watch the change of people over time. But it used to be you, would, you just wouldn't step on a grave. I mean, you walk around it. You, would, you, know, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't do that kind of thing. And there was some kind of etiquette there for that well well they had that same kind of etiquette in the sense that when they were buried if they were outside then those those graves were marked they were whitewashed they were so you knew that a grave was there uh therefore that you wouldn't step on a grave and jesus is saying to these pharisees that when you're uh dirty or clean on the outside but dirty on the inside living a hypocritical life and, and when you're concentrating on the secondary rather than on the primary and, and when you're all about your own pride and people seeing you, he says, you're polluting people. It's like they're, you don't re- they're walking over you and, and they're being affected by your unholiness in these situations. And so he gets done with those three and he moves on. Verse 45, one of the experts in the law answered him, teacher, when you say these things, you insult us too. And so we need to look at these people. These were lawyers of the law. Lawyers of the law. They, they were the ones who knew the law, but then they also created laws. So they, they were ones who made up laws for the laws. So God had laws, and then they made man-made laws to cover those laws, and then lots of times they made other laws even to cover the laws of the man-made laws kind of thing. They were, just, they were all about laws. And sometimes these laws got ridiculous so ridiculous. And so what these men are doing or saying to Jesus is, we're giving Jesus, we're giving you an opportunity to apologize, Jesus. We're giving you an op- opportunity to apologize to say you're dreadfully sorry for offending them. Because if you think about it, he's, he's said some things probably against some of the laws that they've made. We know that they were upset when he came to sit down at the meal and he didn't wash his hands properly. Not in the way that they had described how they were supposed to wash their hands. And then they, he talks about the seed counting. They're probably going, oh, wait a minute, we made that law. We made that law, that's what we're supposed to do. And then when he, he talked about the, the clothing or being seen, those were all man-made laws that were there. And so they're listening to Jesus and they're going, wait a minute, we're offended. 
And Jesus, we're just going to give you an opportunity to write yourself. Do you think he's going to do it? No. Then he said, woe also to you, experts in the law. You load people with burdens that are hard to carry, and yet you yourselves don't touch these burdens with one of your fingers. So he brings up a sixth pole, a fifth pole, a fifth pole. And it, I called it rules over relationships. Rules over relationships. And this is basically what he's saying to him: You are a burden maker, not a burden taker. That's what you are. You're a burden maker, not a burden taker. And this is so different than the way Jesus describes himself. If you have your Bibles, in Matthew chapter 11, and this will be a really familiar passage to you, Matthew chapter 11, starting at verse 28, Jesus is going to speak to his disciples. He's going to describe himself and an invitation of who they are coming to. So Matthew 11, starting at verse 28, it's, Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my, up my yoke and learn from me, because I am lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And it's so drastically different than what the Pharisees and the experts in the law were doing. I mean, they even had a law that um, you couldn't carry anything on the Sabbath in your right or left hand. That you couldn't do that, but you could carry it on the top of your foot. And so, it's, you, you see the ridiculous part of that? But they, they enforced those laws on them. And so Jesus brings this out, and they were making special rules for special people. And the last thing here is the rules had become a judging tool and a means to rule over others. So it wasn't really a rule to help the person. It was a rule to elevate yourself. And um, that's what happens when we make, lots of times, man-made rules. Too many man-made rules. And we don't stick to what God has said in his word. So he pulls back on the reins. Now he's going to pull back again. Verse 47, woe to you, you build tombs for the prophets, and your fathers killed them. Um, here's the sixth pull, and that's cultural wind. I call it cultural wind, whatever the wind, way the wind is blowing. And uh, what they did is he's going to expose a flip-flop in their life. He's going to show a, a, a contradiction in their life. And the real question here is who determines what sin is? That's the underlying issue that we're going to see as he exposes this flip-flop. Who determines what sin is? So he goes on. He says, therefore, you are witnesses that you approve the deeds of your fathers, for they killed them. So he says, you approve that. You say that's okay. That was right. They, they should do that, you know, and they, you approve that. But you will build monuments. So you say that it was okay for them to kill them, but now you're over here building monuments for these prophets and, and, and honoring them. It's a huge flip-flop here. Because of this, the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill and persecute. So Jesus says it was said that these things were going to happen. You were told ahead of time. It was written that it, these things were going to happen. You were told ahead of time that this was going to happen. But you still approve what your fathers did by killing them. And now you're over here building monuments for them. He goes on to say, So that this generation may be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets shed since the foundation of the world. Now, it really makes you beg the question, what are they held responsible to? They're re held responsible to what God has said. That's what they're held responsible to. And then he, he, he fills this out in the last verse here. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, um, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary, yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible. Re held responsible to what? The wisdom of God and what God has said. So I, I want to take issue with this statement. What's right for you might not be right for me. Have you ever heard that? Oh, yeah. 
used all the time. But I want to tell you, it has limits. That statement has limits. Here's the limit. It's okay for samples, but not sin. You can say that about samples. You can say that like, okay, I drive a Chevy and you drive a Ford. And, you know, one's right for me, one's right for you. You know, you can say that in a lot of different scenarios. But when it comes to sin, you cannot say that statement. The only way that you can really stay in that statement is then you have declared that you're the one who determines what sin is and not God. And that's the problem here. Uh, um, It it is written is a powerful intro. When God says, when Jesus says, it is written, that is, I mean, that should take precedence over everything. And that needs to take precedence in our lives over everything. Everything. When, when the wind blows in anything and everything and all this other stuff, we got to come back to it is written. And that's what we stand on. We stand on what he says. Um, and, and this is neat too, Abel to Zechariah. So if you think through it, okay, Abel, the story of Abel is in Genesis, the first book of the Bible. And Abel w- brought his uh, offering to God. And he was honoring God, and he was, he was honorable to God and everything. And what happened to him? His brother Cain killed him. Cain, Cain killed someone who was try, being holy to God, okay? But the first book of the Bible, Genesis. And then he goes all the way to Zechariah, which would have been in the last of the Hebrew books um, of their Bible. Here's Zechariah. And we're told by Jesus that Zechariah was also someone who was following after God, giving, uh, giving the you know, Messiah, uh, Messiah prophecies and everything of God. And he got killed. And we get the information here. He was killed in the sanctuary between the altar and the, and the sanctuary that's there. But it's, it's, it's funny to me, too, is that we have that phrase from A to Z, don't we? And here we have from Abel, A, to Zechariah, Z. He gives us that. So, one last thing here. There's a danger in redefining sin. And that's really the pullback on the reins. Is when we file a cultural winds, we're, pull, we're, we're ignoring him pulling back on the reins of our lives and saying, wait a minute, you're not supposed to be redefining sin. I'm the one who gives you what sin is. And let me give you a great biblical example of this. Daniel chapter 5, if you have your Bibles. I'm going to read a little bit of this story here. Daniel chapter 5. We're actually going to start at verse 18. people of Israel, the Israelites are in Israel, they're overtaken by the Babylonians, King Nebuchadnezzar is the king of the Babylonians, he takes them away from Israel and takes them to Babylon, Babylon. he takes all of them, he takes all their goods, he takes all the things of the temple and everything else and he rules over them. After a certain amount of time then King Nebuchadnezzar is out of the picture and there's King Belshazzar and Belshazzar uh, looks around and he says, hey we're going to throw, I'm going to throw a party. And so he says, you know what? We need some drinking utensils. Oh, yeah. Wouldn't it be cool to drink out of those utensils that, my, you know, that King Nebuchadnezzar brought back from Israel? They're really neat looking, you know, that came out of the temple. Let's use those. You know, and so he gets those, those, temple, those temple vessels that were supposed to be in the temple. He takes those and he says, passes them around and says, fill them up, you know. And so they're having a grand old time. And all of a sudden there's a hand that appears and writes something on the wall. Needless to say, he's, 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 he's afraid. He's like, whoa, wait a minute, what was in that? You know? And he's shaking in his boots, and, they, and they're like, what? what uh, and somebody comes up and raises his hand and says, uh, there's this old guy named Daniel. Yeah, we heard about him. He's, he's done a few things like this. He, he's been able to interpret some stuff. I think maybe you should bring Daniel in for this. And so Daniel comes in to King Belshazzar, and and in verse 18, he starts out by speaking to him. Verse 18, i got to get on the right chapter. And he says, Your majesty, addressing Belshazzar, the Most High God gave sovereignty, greatness, glory, and majesty to your predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar. Because of the greatness he gave him, that God gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages were terrified and fearful of him. He killed anyone he wanted, kept alive anyone he wanted, he exalted anyone he wanted, and he humbled anyone he wanted. 
So Daniel is telling Belshazzar that King Nebuchadnezzar had the authority that he had because God gave him that authority. Then we go to verse 20 and the big word, but, but when his heart was exalted and his spirit became arrogant, he was disposed from his royal throne and his glory was taken from him. He, he thought he was God. And when he got to that point where he thought he was God and he became arrogant about who he was, God stepped in. And God took him out, not necessarily immediately, but God sent him somewhere. Where did he send him? He was driven away, verse 21, he was driven away from the people. His mind was like the animals. He lived with the wild donkeys. He was fed grass like of cattle. And his body was drenched with dew from the sky until he acknowledged that the Most High God is ruler over human kingdoms and sets anyone he wants over them. So he's like a wild man out there. And he's like that until he realizes that, wait a minute, I'm not God. The only reason I had whatever I had was because there is a God. And he recognized that and he came back. Now verse 22, but you, his successor, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart. And here's the, here's the line, even though you knew all this. You knew this, Belshazzar. You knew the history. You knew his testimony. You knew exactly what he went through. You knew that his testimony of coming back and saying there is one God. You knew all that. But verse 23, Instead, you have exalted yourself against the Lord of the heavens. The vessels from his house were brought to you, and you and your nobles, wives, concubines drank wine from them. You praised the gods made of silver and gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone which do not see or hear or understand. You see, you even knew all that, and you still went in and got those vessels, and not only just used the vessels, but you started to worship a God who, who can't do what God can do. And then verse 24, Therefore he sent the hand. Who sent the hand? God sent the hand. And his writing was inscribed. Here's a big pullback. Anytime that we start to redefine sin or replace God, he's going to pull back on the reins and say, whoa, whoa, you're going in the wrong direction. We have one more here. Woe to you experts in the law. You've taken away the key to knowledge. You didn't go in yourselves and you hindered those who were trying to go in. So the seventh pull, as I called it, you lost your keys. I hate losing my keys. You, can't, you lose your keys, you can't get into what you need to get into, right? Well, he said they lost, they lost the key to the kingdom. Um, Jesus speaks of this in Matthew chapter 23. He's going to make a distinction here. He's speaking to his disciples again. And he's speaking about the this, this Pharisees and the scribes and how they're conducting themselves. He says, Then Jesus spoke to his, the crowds and his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees, are seated in the chair of Moses. They're seated in the chair of Moses. That's where the teaching took place. It was set in that chair, and they would read the law. He, they're sitting in that chair. Therefore, do whatever they tell you and observe it. So whatever they're reading from the law, while they're sitting in that chair, you are to observe that and understand that and obey that, and you're supposed to follow after that. But then here's another big but, but don't do what they do because they don't practice what they teach. You ever say that? They don't practice what they preach? Yeah, where'd that come from? Yeah, Jesus said that. They don't practice what they teach. So see, he's making a distinction here is that these people are ceremoniously reading the Bible, but they're not living the Bible. They're not living it. They may be talking about prayer, but they're not praying authentically to him, our Father who art in heaven. They, they may be talking about service, but they're not doing service. So, what is the place of the Bible in your life? What's the place of the Bible in your life? What's the place of it is written in your life? Let me give you another one, or a few more. What is the place of prayer in your life your your time when you stop and you talk to god 
and you make time for that? What's the place for service in your life that you realize that you're not here just for yourself? No, you're here to love God and love others, and therefore that means reaching out to them and actually loving them and caring for them and carrying their burdens. What's, what's, what's the level, what's, what's that in your life? What about fellowship? What about the family of God? What about the gathering with the family of God and, and, and the care and the love that goes on within the body of Christ and forgiving one another and, and, and carrying each other's burdens? And then what about worship? What about worship in your life? Is it, 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 are, you, are you seeing that as, as a time that we gather together not for ourselves but all to raise our voices to our God? Now, let me ask you, are these increasing or diminishing in your life? When you look at your life, are these things increasing or diminishing or decreasing? Because your lack affects others. We're going to focus on the negative here first is that if you look at your life and those things are decreasing in your life, it's going to affect others down line from you in a very negative way. And that's what he's pointing out to the, the, the scribes, the experts in the law, that the way that they're living is affecting others in a very negative way. Now, I'm going to flip it over. Don't worry about that. But let's go through the last two verses here. When he left there, the scribes and the Pharisees thanked him and said, thank you very much for doing that. We, 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 just were, we were sorry that we were going down the wrong road. Thank you for pulling back on the reins. Jesus, thank you so much. Now, that's, that's not what he said. They became opposed him fiercely and to cross-examine him about many things. And the last verse, and they were lying in wait for him to trap him in something he said. Man. I kind of wonder at times if we might act just the same way that the Pharisees and the scribes do. Maybe when something is exposed in our lives and someone's pulling back the reins and maybe it's a brother and sister in Christ talking to you, but it's really God pulling back the reins, especially if it's something that they're talking about biblically from the Bible and they're pulling back from the reins. Do you, do you come back with, I am so thankful you did that. Thank you for pointing that out for me. Or do we at times turn like the Pharisees and the scribes and go, well, I'm going to be watching you. I'm going to watch everything that you say. And when you mess up, don't worry, I'm going to be there because I'm going to let you know it. I'm going to pull your chain. Is that the attitude that we have? Oh, we're not supposed to. Warnings from Jesus to us. Now, I'm going to flip them over because I don't, I don't like staying on the negative, okay? I'm going to flip it over. So when we're talking about the dishwasher problem, when we're talking about being uh, clean on the outside but dirty on the inside, the only way to correct that is we need to practice repentance and confession. That's the only way out of that. That's our Dawn dishwashing solution that you need to add is you need to add that Dawn dishwasher to, that, to the dishwasher so you get the inside clean. That's, that's you need to practice repentance and confession. That's the only way the inside of the cup gets clean. It won't get clean any other way, but you've got to repent and you've got to confess. Second one is, is what's primary. You've got to go back to that and say, what is primary in my life? If I've gotten off on the secondary, what are primary? Primary is that I love God and I love others. And lots of times when we dwell into the secondary, it's because we've gotten a, a little selfish is what's happened. And so we need to stop and say, when that rain is pulled on us, again, remind me what's primary? Love God, love others. Third one is you need to check your humility gauge. When, when, you, when someone pulls back and you realize, I'm getting prideful here. I want other people to see me. And you need to check that humility gauge on your dash and say, where is it? Because I'm supposed to be like him. Philippians 2. I'm supposed to be humble like Christ is humble. Fourth one, need to stop worshiping self. You need to stop worshiping self. And if, you, if, you, you know, if, you're, if you're keeping the inside of your cup dirty 
And, and if you're focused on the secondary, and, and if you're all concerned about other people seeing you, then you have to realize, you have to make the admission, you know what? My God is me. That's who my God is. And you have to stop worshiping yourself. Fourth one, fifth one, uh, love relationships with rules. Now, rules are important. Rules are important. God gives us rules. But we need to love relationships with those rules. That's why we're to speak the truth. That's why that starts that way. Speak the truth. We got to speak the truth. We can't avoid the truth. We got to make sure the truth is there. But speak the truth with what? Love and love. It's got to be there. So we need to love relationships with rules. Even those rules that, that love can't be out of the equation when we talk about rules. The sixth one is we need to stick with God's definition. We need to stick with it is written. And that needs to have bearing and weight on us. And then the last one, spiritual disciplines matter. Spiritual disciplines matter. That asking our questions, are they increasing or decreasing? And I said, you know, the negative is, is if they're decreasing, they're, it's a making an effect downline from you. But if they are increasing, okay, if they're increasing, they are having an effect downline from you. If, if the Bible is rising up in you, if prayer is growing in you, if worship is growing in you, it has a positive effect on those that are around you. But I'll end with this. What will you do when God pulls on your reins? How will you respond? When he pulls on your reins and says, Whoa, Wally, you're going in the wrong direction. I just picked Wally's word because his word is, you know, woe and Wally. Okay, so, whoa, Wally, you're going in the wrong direction. And what if, what if God uses a brother or sister in, the Christ, in Christ, or maybe even his wife, Tony, <laughs> pulls the reins? And it's something biblical. It's, you know, we're talking about something from the Bible. How will Wally respond? Will, will Wally, you know, respond in a way to say, oh, it is written. And will Wally submit to, not Tony, but to God? I mean, he has to submit to Tony too, but, but that's biblical. Um, but will he submit to God? Or will he do like the Pharisees and the scribes and go, huh, okay, Tony, you want to know what you've done wrong? I got a list here. And know that that's the wrong way to respond. And that's what Jesus is telling his disciples in the midst of this huge crowd. He's saying, don't respond this way. When, you, when, I, when I pull on your reins, that's a good thing. It's a good thing. He loves you. If he didn't love you, he wouldn't pull on the reins. And there are times he needs to pull on our reins and say, wait a minute, you're, you're going in the wrong direction. And let's get going in the right direction, right? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this passage of Scripture. And we know that you are, are very, talking very sternly um, to the Pharisees and the experts in the law. And, and they needed that. Um, and, and they were leading the Israelites down a wrong path and, and um, emphasizing things that were, that were ungodly and and um, so, Lord, we understand that, but we also understand that there are times that we can do the exact same things that the Pharisees and the scribes were doing, and we can get off track, and, and that we need someone pulling on our reins, and, and Lord Jesus, that when, um, when and, and the whole idea is that we know this now, it's been written, it's in the book, we've seen it, just like Belshazzar knew about Nebuchadnezzar and, and all that history, we know about this history, so, Lord... We want to be responsible for doing what is right in your eyes. So help us, Lord Jesus, that those things in our life would be increasing so that when we feel the pull of the reins, oh, we might be upset or we might be hurt or we might, you know, we might have some defense mechanism that might pop up first, Lord Jesus, but may we find ourselves on our knees. May we find ourselves um, repenting and confessing. 
may, may we find ourselves um, making sure the humility meter is going back up again. So, Heavenly Father, help us to respond in a right way when the reins are pulled. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing our final song?